I'm used to um, I'm used to seminary students uh, who are always on a different clock. Uh, and I want us now to uh, segue into uh, the Abrahamic uh, covenant, uh, which we find in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. So we're going to walk through uh, three different sections of uh, Genesis, uh, looking at the uh, inauguration of uh, the so-called Abrahamic Covenant. And as, as you're getting your seats, I want you to try and think with me, uh, when the New Testament, when especially Paul, wants to talk about God's administration of grace, he will always default into the covenant with Abraham. When Paul wants to think about God's administration of law, he will default into God's covenant with Moses. Now, that might lead you to all kinds of false conclusions, but there's no getting away from it. When Paul thinks about grace, he thinks about Abraham, and when Paul thinks about law, he thinks about Moses. So, so there's going to be something of a radical contrast between what God is doing with Abraham and what God seems to be doing with Moses, and we want to, ref to examine right, that relationship a little. Uh, let's, let's now go into uh, Genesis 12, bearing in mind what has happened. What, what has happened is a failure on the part of Adam and Eve to fulfill the covenant of works. And then as a result, God's saying in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Right? He's talking to the serpent. Enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, there's a, uh, this, this has been called the first gospel promise. Right? This ultimately is the seed of the woman. Remember how Galatians will speak of that seed, not as of many, but as of one. Right? We'll see that seed principle now emerging in the covenant with Abraham. There'll, there'll be a promise that has implications for a seed. We saw in Genesis 6, in 18, when, when the covenant with Noah is introduced, that the verb is God is confirming a covenant, not inaugurating a covenant, but confirming a covenant that, already, that is already in existence, a relationship with Adam and Eve as a covenantal relationship. Now, uh, we, are, we are going past the flood uh, to the post-Diluvian uh, world in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And the first thing that's going to hit you in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, in this introduction to Abram and God's relationship with Abram, and it's going to be a relationship in which he is going to be given blessings and obligations. Ding, 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 ding. Right? Except that in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the word covenant does not occur. Right? You have to go to Genesis 15 to pick up the word covenant. And again, Moses is using the word covenant in Genesis 15, assuming that the relationship is already in existence, a relationship that is introduced to us here in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now, if you're going to be one of those Bible readers who, who refuses, you know, who, who, who is pedantic about unless the word occurs, it's not there, right? You're going to get into all kinds of trouble because there is no verse in the New Testament that says women participate in the Lord's Supper. Right? That verse does not occur in the New Testament. It's a, it's a verse that has to be implied from other considerations of the New Testament. 
Well, we're doing something of that nature here. There, there is, as we, as we read it in, on into Genesis 15, it has implications for how we are to understand Genesis 12, 1 to 3. But let's read Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in, all, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right, so that's, that's the introduction to, uh, to Abram. The word covenant isn't there. Now, just jump forward to Genesis 15 and verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. And again, the verb made a covenant is a verb that is suggestive of not, not inauguration, but confirming. Uh, confirming an already existing relationship that is, that is actually established here in Genesis 12. Uh, one to three. Now, Ab Abram is given certain directives. He is to, one, leave his country. Secondly, he is to leave his family relations. Now, he doesn't do that altogether. Remember, the, there's a problem that arises with Lot, his nephew. Lot would be a kind of thorn in Abram's side on more than one occasion. So, you could argue that Abram should never have taken Lot. Commentators come down on both sides of this, whether, whether Lot was a violation of what God had commanded or, or, or not. Right? And commentators have, have come down on either side of that issue. But he is to leave his country. He is to leave his family relations. He is to leave, in particular, his father's house and what does that mean? Well, what it means in the Pentateuch is that so long as you're in your father's house, you're under your father's governance. And, and, and Abraham, Abraham is to establish now a family of his own, to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and so on, that, that, that principle of headship. And then fourthly, he's to go to a land which the Lord will show him. Right? So, there, there are these four directives to leave his country, leave his family relations, leave his father's house, and go to a land that the Lord will direct him. And so, the Lord uh, comes to uh, Abram. Notice, as you read Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the initiative in this relationship is entirely the Lord's. Right? There is a divine, sovereign, monogistic manner in which this covenant is established. This is not a partnership. This is not Abraham saying, hey, this would be attractive. Let's, let's, let's talk. Let's work things out. Let's make a deal here. I'll bring my lawyer. You bring yours. And uh, we can make a contract here. Right? There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing here that, is, that, that suggests that this covenant is established by anyone other than God. God is the sole, divine, sovereign, monogistic initiator of this relationship. Right? That's important. In the covenant of grace, the covenant of grace is not a partnership. Right? This covenant relationship that we have with God is sovereignly initiated. Notice number two, it has implications. It has directives. It has responsibilities. It has obligations. Right? It's a covenant relationship. It is a gracious covenant relationship. It is sovereignly initiated, but it has obligations. Now, if I do nothing else today, and, and, and that's all that you've learned today, I'm fine with that. 
Right? That, that, that's my main goal today for us to understand that principle, that in a sovereignly initiated, gracious relationship, there are obligations. I am not under law, but under grace. What does that mean? That I have no obligations. I'm free to do as I like. Let us sin that grace may abound. Right? And what's Paul's answer? God forbid. Right? We are under obligations. You, you are in a relationship of extraordinary privilege and extraordinary blessing, and it is entirely of grace. It's not of your doing. You didn't, you didn't initiate this relationship. God did it. He did it, he did it to, some, to someone who is undeserving. And, and the relationship post-fall is always a relationship that is undeserving, because everybody, Abram included, is now a fallen son of Adam, inheritor of original guilt. Adam, Adam is the federal head of all humanity. So the covenant of works in the Garden of, of, of Eden was a covenant of works not just with Adam and not just with Eve, but with all of humanity. Right? So Paul, in Romans 5, when he looks back, he will say, all of humanity hangs, as it were, on the belt of either Adam or Jesus. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. And you are either in Adam or, the, or you're in Christ. You're in one or the other. You're under the federal headship, the legal representative headship of either Adam or the last Adam, the first Adam or the last Adam, either Adam or Christ. Now, Adam has failed the covenant of works, so every relationship now that God enters into with Noah, now with Abram, is a gracious relationship. It's a, it's a relationship with someone who, who is undeserving, who is, who is guilty by virtue of their association with Adam. But it also has obligations. He is to leave his country, he is to leave his family relations, he is to leave his father's house, and he is to go to a land the Lord will show him. Those are obligations. Are you obligated to do something? Are you obligated to obey? Now there's the word. Is there an obligation to obey within the umbrella of the covenant of grace? Well, Genesis 12, 1 to 3 says yes, absolutely. Now, what are the blessings? Let's look at, um, let's look at Genesis 12, 2. I will make of you a great nation. There are five blessings here. Number one, I will make you a great nation. So this is Abraham, or Abram, uh, from Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, he's, he's a nobody. He's introduced in the previous section of, of chapter 11. Uh, the son of uh, Terah uh, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205, and Terah died in Haran. So, so you've got this nobody and God is saying, I'm going to make you a great nation. Secondly, God is going to make his name great. Now, this is different from saying that Abram is going to make his own name great. Right? The world is full of people who want to make a name for themselves. And that's true in the church as well as in the world. That people who want to make a name for themselves. And God is saying to Abram, no, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you a household name. People are going to know you. People are going to remember you. I, I've never met this guy. I don't know what he looks like. I've seen pictures of artists' impressions, but I've never met this guy, but yet he's a household name. I know this guy. He's part of my family. Because as a Christian, I'm a child of Abraham. Right? That Christians are children of Abraham. Abraham is now our father, not just in the Jewish genetic sense, but, but Gentiles too, by faith. Abraham is my spiritual father. So God made his name great. So thirdly, he, he, will be, he will be a source of blessing. 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now, there's a bit of a debate. Um, I will bless those who bless you, and, in, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be, uh, shall be uh, blessed. Right? So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of a debate here uh, to, to be a blessing uh, between uh, Christopher Wright on the one hand, for example, and uh, let me pick up uh, Kevin DeYoung, for example, in his book, uh, What is the Mission of the Church? And he would take an, a different opinion uh, on that. Uh, the ESV has translated, you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing. Your presence will be a blessing. Um, uh, it's not that Abraham is to go and kind of bestow a blessing on the nations, but that his presence will be a blessing. And it overflows from him. Blessing will come through Abraham. And we know how that's going to work out, because through Abraham, eventually, will come Jesus. Right? Through the line of Abraham, Jesus will be born through the line of Mary. Right? That's so so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which Abraham will be a source of blessing. Uh, notice, too, that others will be blessed in relationship to Abraham. And notice, too, the universal nature, the universal dimension uh, of this blessing. Uh, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You've got a, you've got a, a little picture here of a, a sort of universal dimension of what God is uh, doing in the, in the life, in this covenant relationship with Abram. Now, this passage, of course, has been called the Great Commission of the Old Testament. So, Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is on a par with Matthew 28. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, of a kind of debate, um, acrimonious debate in some quarters. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is, it might be saying... Right? in some interpretations, might be saying that your very presence within a community is a kind of implied blessing to that community. So you don't have to do anything, you don't have to say anything, you, 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 just, you just be there, and that, and that will be the blessing. Right? So you, 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 you go, and you settle, and you live, and you work, and so on, and, and, and just your being there is a blessing. Whereas Matthew 28, of course, is saying, no, you've actually got to speak. You've actually got to vocalize. You've got to preach the gospel, right? Uh, that T-shirt, that slogan, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Well, words are always necessary. There's no gospel apart from words, Amen. right? So throw away that T-shirt because it doesn't mean anything, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the thought is kind of pious, uh, but it's wrong. How shall they hear without a preacher? People need to hear a message, right? A movie isn't enough. A movie of a crucifixion is not enough because people look at a crucifixion and what they see? Well, they, they see all kinds of things. They might see injustice. They might see, well, here's another, here's another pretender who didn't make it. You know, but they don't necessarily see the Son of God in substitution and satisfaction for my sins. That, 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 has, to be, that, that has to be vocalized. Forgive me. This is the terrifying moment for sound guys. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good, I'm back. Right, right, right. So, there's a sense in which Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is not on a par with Matthew 28. Right? Even though sometimes people speak of Genesis 12, 1 to 3 as the great commission of the Old Testament. Um, the great commission involves a mandate to speak and, and to proclaim uh, to proclaim uh, the gospel. Now, let's move to Genesis 15. And let's, and let's pick it up in verse 1. After these things, right, and you've had a kind of hiatus now in 
13 and 14, all caused by Lot, uh, and so on. And, uh, and um, uh, that whole debacle. And now we pick it up in, in Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Right, so first of all, fear not. Well, time has gone by. There's been this statement in Genesis 12, but time has gone by. Things, things have got a little complicated uh, with Lot and so on. Uh, where's this nation? Where's this seed? Where's this progeny? Uh, they still have no children. You know, and Abraham is, uh, is a, not a young man, and neither is his wife. And, and there are implications if there are going to be babies, right? There are biological things that don't work when you're 90. I won't go into it, right? But it's, a, it, it's not just a 2015 problem. It was, it was a problem in, Je- in Abraham's time too, despite the longevity of their, of their lives. So there's a problem here. So fear not. Uh, it's one of those great uh, Bible studies, isn't it? Going through the Bible, uh, looking at those occasions when God comes and says, fear not. Because at the times, those occasions when God comes and says, fear not, are occasions when there's every, there is every reason to fear. Right? You're surrounded by all kinds of things that say, you need to be afraid. F- fear not. And then God says, I am your shield. A symbol of protection. So covenant life is going to involve you in trouble. Covenant life is not, going to, is not one of, of trust in Jesus and all your troubles will disappear. Covenant life involves the threat, a threat to your life, a threat to the stability of your circumstances in which you will need protection, a shield. Verse 2, but Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Right, so part now of the problem, referring back to Genesis 12, he has no heir. So by law, uh, that, 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 that right of, of, um, uh, of heirship goes to uh, Eliezer of Damascus, uh, a servant in his, in his household, And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. And then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So you have Abraham's response. You have God's Word coming to Abraham a second time. And then in verse 6, you've got, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as, right, as righteousness. So uh, Abraham uh, is told to look up at the sky, count the number of stars. How many stars can you count? Just, just without the aid of any, any instrument of any kind, how many stars can you count? Well, I mean a whole lot. Right? And Abraham doesn't have one child, and so shall your offspring be. Uh, and then in verse 6, this, this response of Abraham, uh, he believed, and it was counted, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And now you've got to look at, uh, you've got to look at the solas in the back here on the, on the window pane, uh, because it's emblazoned in the solas of the Reformation by faith alone, by grace alone. Justification by faith alone. Faith apart from works. Faith apart from any, any um, compliance on our part. He believed. And faith is an, is an empty hand. Faith itself is, is, is of the very essence of something that is non-contributory. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked look to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. And of course this is picked up in Romans 4 and in uh, Galatians. 
referring to Genesis 15, 16. It's one of the key texts uh, of Paul with regard to justification. So how is a person saved in the covenant of grace in Genesis 15, 6? By faith alone in the promise of God. Uh, when I, as a seminary professor, we interview uh, you know, wannabe uh, PhD uh, grads who are looking for a job. They want to be seminary professors. And every now and then, a couple of times a year, I'm sure I've sat in a meeting for the last 20 years interviewing uh, someone who's looking for a job. And um, typically, if the person is an Old Testament professor, Old Testament professors... Um, sort of gravitate towards uh, a certain direction in Old Testament studies. And one of the questions uh, that a colleague of mine, who's an Old Testament PhD uh, specializing in ancient Near Eastern um, uh, religion and culture and so on, uh, of the ancient Near uh, Near East, and um, he would always ask this first question to somebody who's uh, looking for a job teaching Old Testament at at, uh, Reformed Seminary. Uh, how is a person saved in the Old Testament? And, I, and the first time I heard it, I thought, you know, seriously? I mean, this is a seminary. But that's like a Sunday school question. I mean, are you seriously asking this question? And then until I heard the answer. And the answer was so complex and so convoluted, uh, I, I suddenly realized, okay, well, this guy is not going to get hired. Because if you can't answer that question in one sentence, that begins with, in exactly the same way as they are saved in the New Testament, then, then you, you haven't got a future here, no, no matter how clever or brilliant you, you may be. So I, I've understood over the years that this was the perfect question to ask, because it divides, for example, it divides dispensationalists from covenant theologians. Dispensationalists believe that there are certain epochs in the Old Testament in which you are saved by works and not by faith. And I'm not saying that, I'm not, that's not a slur, I'm not throwing mud at the wall, just read Schofield's study notes. Right? And in the Mosaic era, a person is saved by works. Here, the principle of salvation is faith. Right? The question we're going to have to ask is, is that a principle that, that continues through from Old Covenant into New Covenant? in the entirety of the administration of of what we call the covenant of grace. Then in verse 9, something peculiar happens. Um, Let's continue uh, reading. Uh, Verse 7, he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess, but he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of the prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And the sun was going down. A deep sleep fell on Abram. Behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the, on the nation that they serve. This is about Egypt and so on. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, You shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now, what in the world is all that about? You've got the inauguration of a covenant that includes this 
ritual of severed carcasses and a smoking f birds of prey uh, trying, to, trying to come down, and then this smoking fire pot, this smoking furnace passing between the severed pieces. And you have to go to Jeremiah 34 for an interpretation of it, because Jeremiah alludes to this passage and tells you what it's about. In Jeremiah 34 and verses 18 through 20. And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. And then further down, their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. It's an, it's an allusion to uh, Genesis 15. What happens if you cut, if you, if you break the covenant? Well, you'll be like these carcasses, right? Killed, slaughtered, cut in half, and food for the carrion, like roadkill. So what is God saying to Abram? God is making a covenant with Abraham, and as part of that covenant, he enters into a self maledictory oath. God is saying in, in vivid pictures, right? this is like a vivid picture. This, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, here it is. Here's the picture. This is what's going to happen to me, God is saying to Abraham, if I fail to comply, if I fail to meet the terms of this covenant. If I, if I fail to fulfill my promises, this is what's going to happen to me. Now, in a sense, this is exactly what did happen to him on the cross. Right? So there's a, there's a trajectory here from Genesis 15 all the way to the cross. Right? But God is saying, here's my covenant. And here's a picture to say, when I make a promise, my promise will stand. And when I make a promise, I keep my promise. And if I don't keep my promise, this is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to be food for the carrion. Now, it's a picture, of course. It's just a picture. But it's a very vivid picture. And God is, in this theophany, God is appearing in the form of a smoking fiery furnace. Now, he'll appear in this kind of form again in Egypt, right, at the time of the Exodus, when he will lead the people by a fiery furnace. There'll be a, there'll be, there'll be a fire re representing the transcendence and holiness and otherness uh, of God. Right? This, is, this is a vivid, colored picture uh, of God entering into a self-maledictory a oath as he, as he inaugurates this covenant with Abraham. Right? He, he, he makes this covenant. The Lord God, verse 18, made a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant is going to involve making of Abraham a great nation and making his name great. And it's going to have universal implications, and others will be blessed through Abraham. Now, jump forward to Genesis 17, and of course, what's happened between Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 is the Hagar method. How is, Abraham going to, how is the promise made to Abraham going to be fulfilled? Well, in Abraham's way. Right? So he, he, he does the Hagar method and the birth of um, uh, Ishmael and so on. So, so all, all of that now has taken place. And, and now we're back again. Here we are again. Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. 
Abraham is 99 years old. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. And that's, of course, significant. El Shaddai, the God who is able to do mighty things. Right? The God who is able to do extraordinary things, what we might consider even impossible things for somebody who is 99 and whose wife is right there up in similar numbers. And God comes now to confirm His covenant. So what's, what's Abraham's… what's the first thing that Abraham hears, right? I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Now, there's a problem. If the covenant is a gracious covenant, why is God introducing this covenant with a mandate, an obligation, a command, an imperative, an obligation, walk before me and be blameless? Because every covenant has obligations. It's not walk before me and then I will enter into a covenant with you. Right? Walk before me and be blameless, and, and then I'll enter into a relationship with you. God has already entered into a relationship with Abraham. There's been a relationship with Abraham since Genesis 12, but that relationship involves Abraham in obligations. It's a covenant of grace, but it has duty. Now again, uh, that's something that I, I, I want us to see here and, 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 and grasp that within an, a, a relationship that is essentially a gracious relationship, there are obligations and there are duties. Walk before me and be uh, blameless. Now, I say that because uh, in dispensationalism, for example, dispensationalism divides covenants into two types, conditional and unconditional. And uh, uh, the conditional covenant, of course, is uh, the Mosaic covenant, and the unconditional covenant is the Abrahamic covenant, except the problem with that is that there are conditions here. You know, we talk about unconditional love, but I'm no, I have no idea what people mean when they talk about unconditional love. It can't possibly mean that there aren't any obligations on our part. They are responsive obligations. They're not obligations in order for this covenant to be initiated, but they are, they, they are obligations on our part. So, Genesis 17 stresses that in a covenant relationship, there is also covenant responsibility. So let's look at it again. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant or I, 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 might, I might confirm my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now, verse 2, I will make firm, I will make my covenant, uh, you could translate that, I will make firm my covenant. It includes, verse 7, his offspring, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. So, this covenant with Abraham has implications for descendants. It is a relationship 
not just between Abraham and God, but between Abraham's progeny and God. The covenant relationship includes the offspring of Abraham. Everyone effectively under Abraham's household, um, household protection comes, is included, comes under the umbrella or the embrace of this covenant relationship. Now, obviously, that becomes important as a paradigm, right, for understanding uh, the relationship of, say, the covenant in the New Testament. Does it or does it not include offspring, right? For, for me, as a Presbyterian and a Paedo-Baptist, my, 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 the line of trajectory that says that covenant, there, there, there's such a thing as covenant children, they too are under the covenant of God. That doesn't mean to say that they're converted, doesn't mean to say they're regenerate, doesn't mean to say that they have a new heart, but they are in a covenant relationship. They're in a relationship that's different from other children. And is that principle something that simply operates in the time of Abraham, or is that principle something that continues in the New Testament? Right? That, that's, a, that's a place that we need to go to. So God confirms His covenant. He makes firm His covenant. He, he tells Abraham that his descendants are also included in this covenant relationship, a relationship in which there are blessings and obligations. He reiterates in verses 7 and 8 the formula, I will be to you a God, and you will be to me a people. I will be a God to you. Notice at the end of verse 8, I will be their God. Uh, what uh, is sometimes referred to as the Emmanuel principle, God with us. Right, so there's this Emmanuel principle, God with His people. Uh, in verse 8, the land promise is uh, renewed. I'll give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. And notice too, uh, in verse 2, 4, 5, and six, Abraham's seed will be multiplied greatly. He'll become the father of many nations. And then notice uh, at the end of verse eight, an everlasting possession. What does everlasting mean? Well, 400 years, basically, until Moses comes. No. Right? But that's what, that's what the Schofield Bible is, is saying. Right? That's what dispensationalism, dispensationalism is saying. God enters into a covenant with Abraham, but it all came, it all came crashing down at the time of Moses because, because Israel made a mistake. Right? They, accepted, they accepted God's law, which they shouldn't have done, although there's no, there's no hint in the text that they were actually given a choice about it. But according to, according to classic old-fashioned dispensationalism, they, they made a mistake. Well, the covenant that God establishes with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. That might give you a clue that it's something, at least in principle, that doesn't simply operate under the Old Testament in the period of the church's infancy. But it's also something that, in, that, that, that operates, the principle of it operates under the new covenant too. Because it's part and parcel of the administration of the covenant of grace. Now, a, a new thing here, partly new and partly not, we haven't talked about it yet, but let's talk about it now. Every covenant that God establishes has its accompanying sign and seal. Now, the language of sign and seal is not my language, it's Paul's language in Romans 4 and verse 11. He talks about circumcision as a sign and seal of the covenant. And so that language, sign and seal, is Paul's language in Romans 4.11 for circumcision. It, it operates as a sign and a seal. 
Every covenant has a sign and a seal. The tree of life was a sign and a seal in the covenant of works. Remember I said there were two trees, one was a sacrament and one was a test. Right? The, the, tree, the, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden was acted as a sacrament. It was a sign of God's covenant relationship with Adam and Eve. The rainbow is the sign and seal of the covenant with Noah. Circumcision now is going to be the sign and seal of God's covenant with Abraham. The Sabbath is going to be the sign and seal, Exodus 32, of God's covenant with Moses. The throne is going to be the sign and seal of God's covenant with David. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the signs and seals of the new covenant. The new covenant gets two signs and seals. Every covenant has a sign and seal. So, so there's nothing new about that. The sign and seal of the Abrahamic covenant is circumcision. Notice in verse 9, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. Oh, there's the obligation again. That is the covenant of grace. It's sovereignly initiated, but it has obligations. You shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generation. Now, verse 10, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now, I want to notice a couple of things here. First of all, it is equating circumcision with the covenant. Now, technically, circumcision is the sign and seal of the covenant, but it is so closely associated with the covenant that there are times when it refers to it as the covenant. The sign becomes spoken of as the thing that it's signifying. Uh, that's not the first time that will happen uh, or the last time that will happen in Scripture, and something similar occurs with baptism in the New Testament. That baptism is so closely, I mean, technically, baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant. It's a sign and seal of the gospel. It's a sign and seal of our need for cleansing from sin. It's a sign and seal of our union with Christ. So, but but, but it is so closely associated as a sign and seal that sometimes you can synecdoche the things in, in, in English grammar the, the things signified can, can often can often be used as a term for the sign itself uh, why circumcision and what is the importance of it uh, let's let's skip forward to Exodus uh, Exodus 4 and verse 24. Remember, Moses is the one writing Genesis 17. Right? The word is given to Abraham, but Moses is the one who's writing this story. And Moses has his own circumcision story. Right? In Exodus 4 and verse 24, with his wife Zipporah at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint uh, and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, I mean, strange sort of incident. P probably what's happening here is that uh, Zipporah, a Midianite, didn't want her baby boy to be circumcised. What is the consequence of Moses not circumcising his own son as part and parcel of what God had mandated as an everlasting covenant with Abraham? At least under the period of the, of the old covenant, this is a sign and, 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 and seal, and God is coming after him uh, to kill him. Right? So the sign and seal, the, 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 the importance of the sign and seal is, is not peripheral. Right? Covenantal signs and seals are not peripheral. Right? They're vitally important. So important that when Moses failed to enact the sign and seal of the covenant with his own son, God is coming to kill him. That's, that's pretty important. 
Uh, it was a sign and seal then uh, of um, uh, to, to, to that, that signaled fundamentally that Abraham's progeny were also included within that covenant um, relationship. Now, if you come down to uh, Romans 4.11 and Colossians 2.11, Let's look at Romans 4.11, first of all. What is circumcision a sign and seal of? Right, verse 11, Romans 4, he received the sign of circumcision, Paul is talking about Abraham, as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So, Paul is saying that circumcision functions in the Abrahamic covenant as more than just a sign of national identity. It was, a, it was more than just a sign of ethnicity, of Jewishness, of, of Abraham clanness. That, that it functioned, first of all, as a sign and seal of relationship with God of God's relation, covenantal relationship with them, as, as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So, so it was a sign and seal of the gospel. It was a sign and seal that through faith, God reckoned him righteous. That's what circumcision was first of all a sign and seal of. However, however, circumcision functioned as a sign of ethnic identity, and that aspect ceases with the Old Testament. Right? There's, 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 there's no longer any redemptive significance to Jewishness or to, or to Israel, right? whatever your views on, on the Jews or Israel is politically, there's no redemptive significance. There is neither Jew nor, nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, and right? all are one in Christ. So first of all, and primarily, circumcision functions as a sign and seal of, of the righteousness that is imputed to us by faith. It's a sign and seal of the gospel. Now, obviously, that's going to have implications, right? No, no prizes no door prizes here for guessing where that conversation is going. It's going in the direction of, do we administer the sign and seal of the covenant to children? Right? So that's going to be the argument for, say, pedo-baptism, the baptism of covenant children uh, in the new covenant, because the principle is enacted here uh, in the Abrahamic um, covenant. Now, again... Uh, it's 11 o'clock, and let me, let me stay to the clock, and uh, let me pick this up uh, in a moment. We're going to segue from Abraham to Moses. We'll, we'll do a kind of, kind of catch-up summary to begin with and, and follow this trajectory. There will be Q&A, notice, at 2 o'clock, only 30 minutes, thankfully, of, uh, of Q&A. So, so store up all of those questions and... Uh, and, and um, Stan is going to answer them all. <laughs> I think Stan has an has a announcement.